One way to suppress the noise is to use maximum a posterior reconstruction. So this is a slide I've shown before. So recall that what we really wanted to do uh, is to maximize the probability that this is the correct reconstruction given this diagram. So that means we want to go in this direction. Somebody gives the sinogram and then we move there. But we consider that to be a difficult inverse problem. And for that reason, we want it to be reformulated such that we would go from the reconstruction to the data. So we say evaluating this probability is doable. Evaluating this probability is very deep. So we derive this probability as a function of that probability, which produced this. We deleted this coefficient because it's the probability of the data. And it's a constant because we're going to maximize over the reconstruction, but we cannot change the data. So one way to say is the probability of the data is constant. Another way to say it is the probability of the data is one because they gave it to us. So it, it is unity because those are the data. But this philosophical discussion, which is entirely irrelevant. And then recall that for convenience, we just deleted the prior knowledge about the reconstruction, which converts uh, which basically then you remain that those two are equivalent, meaning that we can do the easy thing instead of the difficult thing. But of course, that was wrong. And now we start regretting it because we see that if we keep on iterating and maximizing this likelihood, that our image gets actually uglier and uglier. It, it becomes extremely noisy. And we know that tracer distributions and attenuation maps don't look like that. So we undelete it, but now we have to put something in there that encourages smooth images. So we don't claim that we put a lot of prior knowledge in there. There is a lot of prior knowledge that we have and that we will not use. The only thing is that we will tell the algorithm, don't make it too noisy. And if we do that well, then we don't need to bother about stopping rules anymore. We can iterate all the way because it will maximize a function that accounts for images not being noisy. So this is basically the same thing. So this uh, now why is the projection X is the reconstruction. So we have to maximize that. This is the rule of bias. We delete this term and we keep this one. And so if you read papers, typically this is called the posterior. This is called the likelihood and this is called the prior. So before doing the measurement, you're supposed to know this already. We know that images are true, whether we do uh, are, are smooth, whether we do a scan of them or not. Then we do the acquisition. So that provides additional evidence. And that is typically called the likelihood. And the combination of what we already knew and what we learned from the data is called the posterior because this we know after the mission. Now, there's a lot of people calling this not prior, but penalty. But that's exactly the same thing, except for a minus sign. OK, then previously we said this Px px is a constant, so we do away with it. And then we get the maximum likelihood uh, problem that we have been looking at before. But if we don't delete it, then we need to keep it. And then we here, we take the logarithm of it. Of it so we end up with the log likelihood that we had before. But now we have to add another term, which is the logarithm of the prior distribution. Now, in transmission tomography, this was used earlier than in emission tomography. And the reason is that in transmission tomography, we have a lot of prior knowledge that you that is relatively easily written down explicitly. For example, we know that if you're going to scan a patient, that we have in the field of view a lot of air, a lot of soft tissue. And then the, the patient table is going to be there, which has typically attenuation somewhere in between, less than tissue. but more than air because we need a table. And then the lung, which is typically like one fourth or one third of the tissues. So we can make a distribution that has local maxima for values that we like and, uh, and, uh, and only for those values. Meaning that if the algorithm ends up with the value here, it feels that the, like, the, the posterior will go up if it can move that value to the right or all the way to the left. So that means these Values at the local maxima, they're encouraged, and all other values are discouraged. Now, typically, if you use gradient ascent algorithms, or very often also similar algorithms, they, they use the gradient of the likelihood. So for convenience, we used for this 
likelihood a sum of Gaussians. And then you need the logarithm of those Gaussians, which are uh, squared functions, uh, parabolas. And if you take the derivative of a parabola, you get a straight line. So that's about the easiest you can obtain. So that's good from Gaussians. And then it looks like that. This is the gradient of the prior or of the penalty. And here you see again the same thing. So if you end up with values here, then that gradient is positive. So that means this value feels some encouragement, a positive gradient for becoming higher. Until it reaches the tissue uh, attenuation, then we're happy. There is no gradient anymore. And as soon as you move even higher, then the gradient turns negative and tries to pull, tries to uh, tries to pull back the value to the tissue uh, attenuation value. And so you see the same effect uh, for the other local maxima. <coughs> And then halfway, the effect is the other way around. So this value is really not liked at all. If you're here, then you're in this dip here. And then uh, you're either pulled towards tissue or towards lung, depending on, on where exactly you are. Yeah. One problem is that, and that's pretty obvious, is that this function has local optima. So if you make the prior very strong and you give an initial tissue value where it should be lung, then that mu value should move from here all the way here, but it's going to have a hard time because it's going to be pulled back all the time by the prior. So if you make a prior strong and you have a poor initialization, it will get stuck in a local maximum where this is close to uh, tissue attenuation. You don't want that. Um, so those are absolute intensity priors, but you can also, and they will suppress noise because uh, now in tissue, the the reconstructed values will be higher and lower than tissue all over the place, but they will all be pulled towards tissue. So if you have an overestimation in a voxel and you pull it towards tissue, then the neighboring voxels will feel the opposite uh, power. And in that way, they typically all end up a bit closer to tissue. Um, <clears throat> but you can explicitly tell that you like smooth images. And one way to tell that is to say, well, if you know, the values of those voxels here surrounding voxel J, then just those values give me prior knowledge about what should be in voxel J. So you say a priori, I know that voxel J, the value of voxel J has to be very similar to the surrounding values. Uh, and one way to write that is to say uh, there is the logarithm of a prior probability, which we call M here. And it looks a bit like that. It's a function of all these voxel J and all its neighbors. And neighbors can go very far in principle, neighbors all over pixels. Um, and then we invent some function that is uh, higher if that voxel is more similar to its neighbors. Which means that if that voxel is really very similar to its neighbors, that phi is going to be very high for xj. And if we manage to do that in all voxels, then the prior will be maximally happy. The weird thing about this prior is, is that it, it really loves completely flat images. And so it thinks a priori that the, the patient image should be completely flat, which is definitely not true. So it, it's not a very good prior. And it will always be in competition with the data, because what it wants is definitely not what we will have. Here is an, uh, an example of such a prior, um, which is a quadratic prior. So basically, you compute the difference between voxel j and its neighbors, and you square it. It's always positive. Now we need a maximum when we're happy, so we put a minus sign here. So the, the best we can achieve is 0, then we're maximally happy. And otherwise, we get a negative value indicating that we're less happy. Okay. And if we apply uh, such a prior, then this is uh, what we typically get. So this is the MLAM image. And if we would iterate longer and longer, it would become noisier and noisier. This is the map image. And if we iterate longer and longer, nothing will happen anymore. Because the data will want to introduce more noise, and the prior will fight more noise. They get an equilibrium. And if we tune the prior well, that would be just fine. And we get a good balance between resolution and noise. But you can, of course, invent other functions. <clears throat> um, 
again, this is the same thing. So we need some energy, it's called energy here, um, of two neighboring voxels. And very often people write it as a difference between two voxels, but you don't have to do that. Could be a ratio or anything else. So this is the true activity. So kind of Shep Logan like phantom. And uh, I have created a noise sinogram of that. And if I do an LEM reconstruction, then this is what I get with a lot of noise that we want to suppress. So here is the quadratic prior. So uh, this is pixel, the difference between pixel J and its neighbors. We're maximally happy here. And our unhappiness increases quadratically with that difference. And you see that it definitely smooths, but it also suppresses the resolution. So we have a sharp boundary. Uh, or we should have a sharp boundary here between that skull and the, the brain or whatever it is. And you see that the boundary is blurred, but the noise is suppressed heavily. So then we could say, well, that's a pity because if the difference is very large, it seems likely that it's actually data. And we, we don't think that the noise will create very, very large differences between neighboring pixels. So that means we can, or, or to write it down explicitly, we can say, okay, if the, Differences between neighboring voxels are small. It seems likely that they are due to noise and we will penalize them quadratically. But once the differences get larger than some value that we have to tune, then we think that there is a chance it's actually data and we will penalize them less than quadratically, meaning less than here. And that means that edges should be better preserved. And that's what you see happening here. So now that edge with the skull is sharper and uh, for those two hotspots, a bit sharper too, but then all the boundaries like here, they're still as smooth as they are here. And that is because the contrast here is less and they're still in the quadratic region. So we can modify that by tuning that turnover value. Well, you could argue if you really believe it's data, why penalizing it still linearly? Maybe you should not increase the penalty at all. <coughs> and so, uh, Jamel and other uh, researchers proposed priors that do that. So they, they are quadratic here and then they become completely flat. So the gradient is zero, meaning that you don't care anymore about those gradients. But there are two disadvantages. One is that you get this kind of you know, plastic effect. So you get very sharp gradients, even in places where there are no gradients at all. So it, it groups similar noise in clusters and medical doctors don't like these mosaic-like images. And second, it introduces local maxima. And um, there is a feature that says that if um, this uh, prior is concave, then it does not introduce local maxima. So that means if you connect two points of the function and you're above that function everywhere, then you don't have local maxima in the prior that is uh, using this function. And you see that that is clearly the case for the quadratic prior, no matter where I connect two points, the line will always be above the curve. For the Huber prior, that is just true. So if I connect two points here, they will clearly be above the point. But if I take one point here, another one here, the, the, the line connecting them is on top of the curve. So that is minimal concavity, but it's just enough. So that means the Huber doesn't introduce local optima. But this one does, if I connect this point to that point, I'm below the curve. So that means this JMAM introduces local maxima. And that means if I do the reconstruction again, but now starting with a different initialization or using a different number of subsets or changing anything, then I might get a, a, a different image from that. And that makes most people very uneasy. Uh, and therefore, these priors are not popular at all. Definitely not in emission tomography and also not much in transmission tomography. Yeah, here is one more. As I said, so the Huber prior is maximally con or, or minimally concave, just no local maxima. So you can push this a bit further and say, okay, I'm not going to do any quadratic penalty at all. So I'll just make it linear all over the place. Then we have this edge preservation also here where previously we have been blurring. And indeed you see that that's the case. So now we get sharp boundaries essentially everywhere. And inside the boundaries, the image is pretty smooth. So everything looks good. But if you look at the boundaries, they're not really where they should be. So the algorithm likes boundaries, but 
doesn't always put them at the right position and then it's because of the noise. So if you do another noise realization, it, the image would look similar, but the boundaries would be at different spots. And so now the variance is concentrated around these boundaries and here the variance is much larger than here, but everywhere else the variance is lower. And a good thing about this thing is that it doesn't have local optima. Uh, a, a sad thing about it is that medical doctors don't like it either. And so vendors that have been introducing this in their reconstruction learned from their customers that these images are not popular at all. And they came up with all kinds of tricks to find a good balance between uh, this total variation image and either a smoothed version of FBP or an LEM or uh, a kind of balance between a quadratic trial and this trial, where they, the customer gets uh, a tuning uh, possibility to choose that balance because they have different tastes too. Now, um, as you mentioned, there is problem tuning these parameters, in particular for emission tomography, because it's much harder to predict what we're gonna see. For transmission tomography, it's much more doable. <clears throat> there we know we're typically gonna have tissue, soft tissue almost everywhere and then bone, and then very important boundaries between tissue and lung. And we know that the amount, that the size of the, 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 the that contrast, that means we can say, okay, all uh, differences that are larger than, for example, uh, one third of the contrast between lung and tissue, they might be data. If they're smaller than that, we're almost short with noise. So there is some uncertainty, but it would be much easier to find agreement between many people on how that value should be tuned. And if you tune it like that, you also get decent uh, results. Because our prior knowledge in transmission topography is really a lot stronger than in emission topography. Okay, and here are some results uh, for uh, transmission tomography. So this is three reconstructions from exactly the same uh, transmission and blank uh, data. So the transmission was pretty noisy. This is reconstructed with FVP, where you have the typical horizontal streaks, which you also see in CT, but less dramatically there. And that is because the attenuation along the horizontal lines here was much higher than along all other lines. So they contribute more noise. And in FVP, they're allowed to contribute just as much as the lines that provide actually more information. So we got all these horizontal streaks, which you see clearly here, but also here. If you do instead the maximum likelihood reconstruction, then just like in emission tomography, we see that the streaks are gone. The, the noise becomes more like salt and pepper noise. Um, and if you use a maximum a posteriori reconstruction, you get even better results. And here we can tune that Huber, as I just said, such that it, it will tend to preserve uh, the, the contrast that we expect. And we can add an absolute intensity prior, and then you see that we get pretty nice results. So in, especially non tough pet it is very important to make sure that you don't fill air cavities with tissue, because if you do that, the, you will get artifacts and the artifacts look like hotspots. And hotspots is exactly what the medical doctors are looking for. So if I would fill this, this thing here, I would create a hotspot in my activity image. And if it's hot enough, the medical doctors will treat it as a, a leash. So we need to preserve these air cavities and you see that with this prior, that's pretty well done. Well, if you would do some post-processing on this, then it's much more likely that you will accidentally fill some of those cavities. This one avoids that because it keeps looking at the data. Is it okay what I do? And the data keeps saying, no, 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 we have too much attenuation. We need a bit less attenuation. And also you see that some bone pops up, but not where it should be. So CT would collect all of this and put it in, in a nice uh, arm bone. Uh, here it's all over the place, but it is distributed such that the activity along the LMRs should be about right. So it looks scary. We believe that we should not be too worried. The attenuation is there. And if you attenuate it, if you compute attenuation along LMRs, it, it's gonna be about right. And here's an extreme example, pretty old because yeah, we don't do these kind of things anymore. So this is a, a classical transmission scan. So just reconstruct with FPP. And you see it looks horrible and that's because it was a very short transmission scan. And in addition, 
the source had, had decayed significantly. So it, it was a weak transmission source and a short scan, it's a very bad combination. So this thing is, is just a truncation effect uh, that could be avoided, it's due to normalization, but everything else is just artifacts. And then if you use that, uh, transmission scan your forward projected to create the attenuation and then you do attenuation correction and flip the back correction with that then you get this and this is clearly a useless image. Now if we would instead use this for attenuation correction but reconstruct the image with maximum angle reconstruction rather than FVP then the image starts coming out but we have these horrible art artifacts here and we get them directly from the attenuation. So we're gonna do something about that too. We make a maximum a posteriori deconstruction of the attenuation image, which starts looking cool and actually it even reconstructs the bone here. Uh, and now we use that for attenuation correction with maximum likelihood, expectation maximization, and we get a clinical image out. So, and, and this I show also to uh, repeat what I said previously, the, in the beginning, it was hard to show that MLM is superior to FVP because everything was tuned such that FPP would produce good clinical images. Um, here is an example where these uh, iterative algorithms and statistical algorithms managed to produce decent clinical images. And if you would go back to FPP, they don't at all. So they're clearly more powerful and they really allow us to decrease the noise and to do all kinds of stuff that with FPP would not be possible because of the uh, well, first, because it's more difficult to model the physical effects, and second, because the noise the propagation is, is uh, worse. Uh, our group and others thought, well, if we can do this in PET, then we can also do it in radiology, because CT uh, is more of the same. You would think uh, very similar to PET transmission. You have a transmission source, you have noisy data, make a reconstruction. So we can do the same for um, CT and here the filter back correction algorithm, uh, filter back correction reconstruction, and here is maximum likelihood reconstruction. And you see we get the expected result. Those horizontal streaks are gone. So there is some improvement, but we have to admit that these horizontal streaks are not really showstoppers here. So there is some improvement, but it would probably have little clinical effect. But having said that, you could say, okay, but now we could reduce the dose a bit. And then hopefully we could still see what we would no longer see here. But now it's tempting to suppress that noise even further. And recently that's become very popular because people uh, get more and more concerned about the dose uh, uh, given to the patient. And so, um, yeah, and also the difference between these two is actually not, ne not nearly as large as it was in PET. And so now uh, people are looking at maximum posteriority construction where we suppress the noise during reconstruction. And then at first sight, you get an image that's clearly better. So the noise is lower and, and it looks very similar otherwise. But if you carefully examine the images, then I'm not sure they're better at all. Like um, for example, here, you see some structure. I'm not sure what it is, but it looks like data. And it's well preserved by the maximum likelihood. It's probably even improved, but it's pretty strongly suppressed by the maximum posterior image. So I, I don't expect it has clinical value, but if it can do away with things like that, maybe it can do away with interesting stuff too. So um, that means just looking at that image and, and deciding how nice it is, is not enough. We have to ask the medical doctors to examine those images. And so <clears throat> these iterative algorithms, different flavors of them are being, have been introduced in the hospital and the vendors keep on working on them. And when they were introduced at first, people were extremely enthusiastic and said, oh, now we can decrease the dose with a factor of 10. But then a lot of them did careful studies asking the MDs, compare the images, tell us what you see. And then they said, well, maybe we can reduce the dose with a factor of three, but not more than that. Having said that, a factor of three is, is not bad at all because the currently dominating source of, uh, of um, radiation in, in Western countries is clearly medicine, much more than, than Earth. And that shouldn't be the case. So it, it's important to do those reductions. A factor of three is very valid. 
This is again to show the difference between uh, transmission tomography and emission tomography. So uh, as I said, we know a lot in transmission tomography and also we care, we don't care much about how that reconstructed attenuation map looks as long as it is a good estimate of the attenuation we're having. And as a result of that, we can be pretty aggressive in the uh, priors we use and get good results. In emission tomography, you have to be much more careful. And here is an example of that. So this is an MLM reconstruction. And this is the median root prior, which several years ago was pretty popular. It's a heuristic thing, but it's it's a good idea. And it basically, um, yeah, it's, it's, an, it, it's very heuristic, but it basically encourages the image to be the result of uh, median filter application. It's actually not the median root because median root means that you keep on applying the median filter until it doesn't do anything anymore. And that's possible if you take an image and you median filter it, it looks very different. And if you median filter it again, it will again be slightly different, but that quickly converges. And the median filter doesn't make your image flat. It, it just uh, yeah, encourages edges and smooths locally, but after a while it's done and it doesn't change anymore. It always converges to an image, not to something unusual. And that image is called the median root. You can median filter it forever, nothing will happen. Actually, the name is wrong. It applies a medium filter, but it doesn't go for the medium. But anyway, you see, it's very effective. So it dramatically suppresses the noise and it inherits from the medium filter that it is pretty good at preserving edges. For example, here, the, the edges of the mediastine and the liver are very well preserved. And we know that the liver should be uniform, so it did a very good job. Again, here is a streak, which is due to that hot lesion here. But you see that the small lesion here has suffered dramatically from the median filter. And the reason is that lesion is very small. And if you have in extreme, so you have a, a three by three filter. If, if uh, you apply a median filter to that, then it will replace um, yeah, the, the pixel value by that of the majority of the surrounding pixels. So if the, most of the pixels are low and only the central pixel is high, it will completely be eliminated. And something like that is happening here. So most of these pixels have a majority in the background, meaning that they're replaced by low values. And so, which is a reason to not use that media root prior uh, in oncology, for example, because it could really suppress lesions that you clearly see in the MLA image. So this, this MLA image is superior uh, to this image if you're interested in lesions. Here is the relative difference prior, which is one of the attempts to avoid this effect and still have some edge preservation. And you see it's a good intermediate between the two. So it, it um, suppresses the noise. Uh, it's, it's not as, as cool as the median root filter in uh, doing that, uh, median root prior, but it uh, doesn't suppress that lesion nearly as much as it does here. Again, we should tune the betas for to make a, uh, a really fair comparison, but I'm very sure that uh, even with tuned betas, the median, the, the relative difference will do better than the median root because it wasn't designed actually to do. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> and so in, in the previous, I've shown you that if you iterate the medium forever, as you know, you get very uh, high noise propagation. So the noise gets higher and higher and is heavily negatively correlated. And that means that if a pixel is overestimated, the neighbors tend to be underestimated and not a So the noise is high frequency in the frequency domain. And that means that smoothing is extremely ex uh, efficient because the smoothing will suppress the high frequencies and most of the noise is sitting there. So a little bit of smoothing improves the image pretty dramatically. And so one way to get um, regularization is just to keep on iterating and then post smoothing. And I've shown you that as a method to get more or less uniform resolution in the image. But then there is an alternative, which is to pick some prior that you like and use that during reconstruction. And then the advantage is that the noise will never build up. So the, the reconstruction will converge. If you iterate long enough, then subsequent iteration will do nothing anymore. And then you also get a smooth image. And so here, are two ways to smooth the image and it's hard to decide which one is the best. In my opinion, they look pretty similar. Don't see too many differences. But if you apply it 
to this simplistic phantom with, with the radioactive ring, then you see that the uh, prior suffers from the same problem that we had when we stopped iterations early, and which is that the resolution is not uniform. And so the reason is that the, um, the, the prior is a simple function that wants to smooth and it's applied everywhere in the image with the same strength. So it likes to smooth here in the middle and it also likes to smooth at the edge. But it needs to find, fight the gradient of the likelihood. And that gradient is much higher here than in the middle. And that is because the data have in a way much better seen this edge than that edge because this edge is less attenuated. Right? These lines uh, see much less attenuation than the lines through the center. And in addition, this activity is surrounded by a lot of other activity. So it, it's hidden in the noise of all that activity while this one is not. So the likelihood provides much more evidence that there has to be a gradient, uh, that, that the, the ring is here and much less evidence that there is a ring there. And so that means that here at the edge, the fight between the likelihood and the prior uh, is basically won by the likelihood or the, the likelihood is a, a good job there to push, um, yeah, it's, it's preference. And in the middle, that's less true. The likelihood is weaker and the, the, the prior smooths with the same enthusiasm and therefore the, the balance is more towards the prior. So that's obviously, well, that, that again, in some cases we don't mind and actually it could be even beneficial. Like if the, the question is to detect the presence of the ring, this image is at least as good as that one. And there is some evidence that actually might even be better. But if you want to do quantification and check if the ring is uniform or not, then this image is definitely not good. All right, <clears throat> so what you can do then is say, well, the problem of the prior is clearly that its weight is the same everywhere. So we're going to change its weight and we change it. You have to change it in a counterintuitive way. So if the likelihood provides more information, you have to rely more on the prior. And if the likelihood provides less information, you have to rely less on the prior. And if you do that, you can make sure that the balance between the prior and the likelihood is more or less the same everywhere. And that way you, you can avoid this oversmoothing by the prior by weakening the prior uh, and make it just as weak as the likelihood. Actually, if you want to do that really well, you have to do it even orientation dependent because uh, you recall that example that I gave with the point source, which is surrounded by activity. There was good convergence in one direction, but not in the other. So if you really want uniform, uh, uniform point spread function, which is uh, isotropic, you actually have to adjust the weight of the prior even differently in different directions. So it's pretty tough to do. Um, and Jeff Fessler and Webb's Timon have been working on that. And then I couldn't resist trying this myself too. And so, yes, it, it works, but it's pretty difficult. And then we found that if you, um, so it, it works. So you get an image like this. But then we, we found that the variance of this image is actually the same as the variance of uh, post smoothed MLM. So that means um, if, if you adjust the prior really well, such that you get a uniform resolution, and you get a particular variance uh, associated with that, if instead you iterate forever and you post smooth and you post smooth such that you get exactly the same resolution, then you get the same variance too. And so um, from that, you can conclude, well, that was my conclusion. Then I go for post smooth of MLM. It's much easier. We iterate pretty long and we post smooth. Straightforward to do, easy to implement in the hospital. So I told that to Jeff Fessler and he said, no, no, I don't agree at all. Um, the prior is, is, well, it's more fun, of course, for, especially if, if you're specialized in, in image reconstruction. But in addition, the prior improves the condition. And that means that the, um, the function that you optimize is better behaved. And another way to say that is that the uh, curvature of the likelihood 
near the maximum is higher if you have a prior than if you don't have a prior. Okay, so we want to maximize a function, and if that function near its maximum is flat, then it's very difficult to really find the optimum point. You can do a lot of changes with small changes in the cost function. If the uh, curvature is high, then that means that near the maximum, if you do a small change to your solution, then the likelihood will go down very quickly. So that, that's good because then you can easily find the optimum. And so if you add a prior to the likelihood, then usually the curvature gets higher. Um, so the, the total cost function is more well behaved and almost all algorithms will converge faster in that situation, if, even if you don't modify them exploiting the presence of that prior. So Jeff Fessler argued, well, you can get the reconstruction done with fewer iterations. But of course, you have to do more work per iteration because you have to adjust that prior to make it, um, to adjust this weight, to, uh, to make sure that the weight is the same as the, the lacrim. OK, so currently, this is what we do because this is pretty difficult. Well, as you all know from Georg's work, you, you can make a more sophisticated priors. Um, and the, the, the first one we made like that, we called um, AMAP, anatomical maximum a posteriori, and it relied on segmentation of the brain. So yeah, we, it's, it's much easier for, for brain than for the rest of the body, because for brain, uh, the head is as good as rigid, the, the brain is slightly changing uh, with your heartbeat, but that those, those motions are very small. And so with better resolution, currently we can ignore them. So we can treat the brain and the head as a rigid object and it, the registrations work pretty well. So we can always or almost always align our anatomical image pretty well with the PET image. So the rest of the body, that's much trickier. So at, at some time I tried applying an anatomical prize to the rest of the body and that gives very nice results too, but it's dangerous because there can always be a mismatch. For brain, there is much less of a mismatch. And then in addition, there is lots of good uh, software to do uh, segmentation of, of the brain from MR images and that's shown here. So this is the T1 image and then um, I'm not sure which one, I think this was SPM which segmented the gray matter, the white matter, and the cerebral spinal fluid. And so once we can rely on these segmentations, we can apply a lot of prior knowledge that we have of most PET traces that we use in the brain. And for example, for FDG, we know that um, the glucose consumption in the gray matter is much higher than the glucose consumption in the white matter. And CSF is basically just water. There is no glucose consumption at all, and the, the FDG is not supposed to end up in the CSF. So we can tell the algorithm, OK, make a reconstruction, but make sure that um, there is no activity in the CSF. And that, uh, ah, in addition, if, for example, we know that the diseases we're looking for are much more likely to occur in gray matter than in white matter, we can tell the algorithm the white matter is OK. So make it smooth. Uh, if something strange happens, put it in the gray matter. And so that way, we can, we can get much better images. And the aim actually is to um, do a very good regularization. And we need a very good regularization because the PET image is noisy. And in addition, we want to model the resolution such that we get de-blurring during reconstruction. And if we have this de-blurring, uh, de -blurring, then uh, we will have Gibbs artifacts because there are multiple solutions to the problem. And by exploiting the MR, we hope to suppress those Gibbs artifacts without losing uh, all the resolution. And so here is that uh, shown. So we have the, the MR here. In, in usually the radiologists show it in black and white, not in white and black. Here is a PET image. And the comparison is not entirely fair. So this PET image is reconstructed without any resolution modeling. And it's, of course, pretty blurred. And then this one is reconstructed with the resolution modeling. And the Gibbs artifacts are suppressed by applying this uh, AMAP prior. And, and this is the result. And you see it definitely uh, looks a lot better. Um, and we have also, well, in, in simulations, we clearly see that it's more quantitative. And every now and then, there are examples showing that it's actually really 
useful that it's doing something. And so for example, here was a patient with refractory temporal lobe epilepsy. And so there's clearly a lesion here, but then there was a suspicion that maybe there is a, a decreased uh, tracer uptake here too, which, which could indicate that actually the other side is affected too. But then by modeling the resolution and uh, using the DMR, uh, the segmented DMR as a prior, we see, uh, we, we get this uptake and we see that the uptake here is the same as in the rest of the gray matter. And that the reason that it looks less intense is that there is just a little bit less gray matter here than here. So from this image, the conclusion was yeah, that the right side is affected, but not the left side. 